So my argument is simply that we make more explicit and more democratic the judgments that societies inevitably make about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good and how generously it should be rewarded. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Last episode, we discussed with Adrian Bullrich the benefit of meritocracy. But of course, meritocracy has lots of costs too. As we discussed, the, the very book that invented the name meritocracy was pointing out uh, some of the problems with meritocracy. So we thought that uh, we're going to bring an expert on the dark side of meritocracy. There is nobody better than Michael Sandel, who is a pro professor of political philosophy at Harvard University and wrote a book last year called The Tyranny of Merit. And uh, make sure to stick around until the end of the episode where we have a surprise for you. So, Michael, many people blame meritocracy for its shortcomings. Your criticism is a little bit differently. If I read your book correctly, the problem you see in meritocracy is not so much the failure to live up to the ideal, but the idea itself. Can you explain? Yes. Merit in general is a good thing. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. But meritocracy as a system has a dark side. And the dark side is that it rationalizes inequality. It rationalizes unjustified inequalities. And it's corrosive of the common good. It leads the successful to believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve the bounty the market bestows upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle, those left behind, must deserve their fate as well. So, Michael, you are a philosopher and you think about what is just. I am an economist and I tend to think about what is efficient. In your book, which is emphasized on the justice part, there's not a lot about the efficiency part. In fact, there, there is a quote from Hayek that I thought was interesting, that Hayek did not try to justify morally the system, but tried to justify on efficiency. So what is your view on the efficiency ground. So if we have a good redistribution system exposed, don't you want to have a system that produces the, the maximum amount and then redistribute rather than a system that produces much less? Well, it depends, Luigi. It depends on the maximum amount of what. Efficiency, is, as you well know, is a stand-in for making stuff, productivity, GDP. A lot of what counts as GDP is productive is worthwhile and important, like that surgeon's services. But a lot of it is not so important, morally speaking. There are people who make lots of money uh, as hedge fund managers engaging in speculative activities that have very little to do with improving the productive capacity of the economy. There are people who make lots of money figuring out how to sell sugary sodas in copious amounts to consumers. That shows up as productivity, as efficiency, but morally and socially, it's not so important. So as far as hiring people who are well qualified for important jobs, yes, that's a good thing. But that doesn't add up to a justification of meritocracy. And it's interesting, as you mentioned, Luigi, Hayek was against meritocracy. He said it was a confusion politically and morally to assume that the value people contribute to the economy is the measure of their merit or virtue, or worth. He pointed out that markets reward all sorts of morally contingent attributes, happening to have this or that skill, the fact that it may be scarce or plentiful in the labor market. This is no doing of the person whose skill or talent it happens to be. So on these grounds, and here I agree with Hayek, he thought it was a mistake. And he, he actually was concerned, I think, more with liberty than productivity. But that's perhaps a further discussion. But so uh, help me out here, because the way I tend to interpret what you're saying, I might be completely wrong, so feel free to say, but the way I interpret it is, look, you're not against uh, rewarding people that do better or they are more talent because we need to attract them to places that uh, where they are more productive. What you are 
against is a superimposing a moral value to that, is the fact that not only they make more money, but also they are more respected. I, I grew up in, in a small university town in northern Italy, where my father was a professor, an Italy professor, not particularly well paid. And so I grew up with the idea that what you make is not necessarily an indication of how much you're worth or, or your value. So I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to uh, the separation of the two. But is it just what you're saying or there is more? Do you want to really undermine the allocation system or you would simply want to uh, not uh, empower it with this sense of arrogance that is has prevailed in the last few years? I certainly want to disempower the arrogance that has come to be associated with the system of reward in recent decades. I call it meritocratic hubris. This is the tendency of the successful to inhale too deeply of their own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, and also to lose sight of the, their, their indebtedness for their achievements and for their rewards to those who, who made it possible. So I certainly want to do that. But I think that points to a different kind of politics, a different kind of debate, a different attitude toward markets. I, so I, I, I like the scenario that, that you uh, just mentioned, Luigi, about growing up in Italy and the way in which the amount one made didn't translate into a sense of one's worth. I think you would probably agree that we're quite far from that sensibility today. So in principle, Luigi, you want to detach, and I also want to detach the money people make from judgments of worth and of social esteem. But to do that is quite an ambitious political undertaking. It requires a morally more robust kind of public discourse and political debate about tax policy, about distribution, about production, about directing technology to affirm the dignity of work rather than undermine it. And that's the kind of project that my book proposes or, or, or at least tries to suggest. In, in your book, you seem to reserve some of the harshest criticisms actually to the center-left leaders. And as you point out in your book, even Obama, in his speeches, he uses the meritocratic rhetoric all the time. And yes. you arrived even to say that uh, the defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016 is due to the meritocratic hubris of calling sort of deplorables the one who are the unlucky ones. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, exactly, Luigi. I think one of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites that we saw in 2016 with the election of Trump, that we saw with Brexit in Britain, is the sense among many working people that credentialed, well-educated elites look down on them. And this is connected to the train of political rhetoric that you just mentioned. When uh, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton in the 1990s uh, came onto the political scene succeeding Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, free market advocates, Clinton and Blair accepted the basic premise of the market faith. They softened it, they moderated its, its harsh edges, but they connected the inequality that was rising and would continue to rise into the 2000s by saying, Meritocracy is the answer. Individual upward mobility through higher education. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to college. What you earn will depend on what you learn. That was Bill Clinton's slogan. You can make it if you try. That was Barack Obama. What they missed was the insult implicit in that seemingly uplifting advice. If you did not go to college, and if you're not flourishing in the new economy, your failure is your fault. And it became politically quite consequential when one remembers that most Americans don't have a four-year college degree. Nearly two-thirds don't. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life, a four-year college degree that most people don't have. It's a recipe combined with the attitudes we've been discussing, the hubris. It's a recipe for resentment, for anger, and political backlash. And that's exactly what we saw. How did it happen that those people who were supposed to be the defenders of the downtrodden, or at least who portrayed themselves as the defenders of the downtrodden, became actually the ones who justified this system to the greatest extent? It's a fascinating question. And the way it happened was, by 2016, 
when Donald Trump was elected, the Democratic Party was more attuned to the interests and values and outlook of the professional classes, the well-educated, well-credentialed classes, than to blue-collar voters. And what's interesting is that the same thing happened to the Labour Party in Britain. The same thing happened to the Socialist Parties in France, to the SDP in Germany, to the Democratic Party in Italy. And this, I think, accounts for the populist backlash, which has mainly been in the name of a kind of right-wing authoritarian hyper-nationalist populism. The success of right-wing populism is usually a symptom of the failure of progressive politics. It, it's important to remember that it was the Democratic Party, along with Republicans, that deregulated the financial industry in the 1990s, that decided not to regulate derivatives. And it was the Democratic Party, along with the Republican Party, that oversaw the bailout after the financial crisis of 2008, a bailout that spent hundreds of billions of dollars helping the banks, leaving most ordinary homeowners to fend for themselves. These parties then began to receive campaign contributions from these industries. Barack Obama was the first Democratic presidential candidate to receive more in campaign contributions from Wall Street than his Republican opponent. The Democratic Party, Progressive Party, center-left parties made their peace with concentrated power. That's the broader point. Traditionally, their role was to make government a counterweight to concentrated power. They gave up that role. I want to pause for a moment on the global financial crisis and at the risk of making this personal, it was the moment for me where I rethought everything I had believed up to that point. I had previously seen malfunctions in our market system, in our business world as aberrations. And with the global financial crisis, for the first time, I saw it as systemic in the sense that the people in charge really weren't worthy of being in charge. They didn't actually know, know what they were doing. We, we talked to Martin Gurry recently about his book, The Failure of, of the Elites. And I've been thinking more and more that the global financial crisis really was a rupture in the social fabric, almost more so than it was in the financial fabric of the world, because we fixed in some ways the ruptures in the financial fabric. But what you can't fix is the rupture in, in the social fabric. The idea now that there is this giant event that not only did the elites who ran the system come out of OK, but that also offered proof that those who supposedly were being paid for their skill and their ability to, to run these complex financial institutions actually they weren't, weren't worthy of that. Yes, yes. And if I could just add, Bethany, another amplification of your observation. In The Tyranny of Merit, I emphasize the moral argument against meritocracy and try to explain how it rationalizes unjustified uh, rewards. But there's also a practical critique to be made against the meritocratic elites who have governed during this period of neoliberal globalization. If you think about it, these, elite, these meritocratic elites have actually governed very poorly. They brought us four decades of stagnant wages for most workers, inequalities of income and wealth not seen since the 1920s, the Iraq war, a 20 year inconclusive war in Afghanistan. They brought us financial deregulation, the financial crisis of 2008, a decaying infrastructure, the highest incarceration rate in the world, and a system of campaign finance that makes a mockery of democracy. So even from the standpoint of the claims of elites to be well qualified to govern the financial industry and the economy, they haven't done very well. So let's try to think about what is the alternative because uh, an idea is, is beaten only by another idea. So. How would you replace meritocracy? My, my inclination would be you still allocate things based on merit, but uh, you temper with some uh, social, uh, if not economic, reward to other people. After all, I always thought that social reward were a compensation for lack of economic reward. When, uh, when you admire a military hero, the military hero did something for the common good, but did not get paid very much, and he gets paid in social reward. So why society today fails to recognize the socially worthy, at least socially? And I'm not saying that this is in place of, but at least it's a beginning. Well, we saw some of this during the pandemic, especially the early months of the pandemic. You remember when 
in the evening, people would go onto their balconies, especially in Europe and in Italy, and, and clap, applaud for essential workers and for the medical workers. So one could say this is like pinning a medal of recognition, of honor on a successful general, a kind of social reward that compensates, that's compensatory for the lack of an economic reward. But I think that's not enough for two reasons. First, people who make valuable contributions to the economy and the common good should be rewarded economically for the contributions they make. Secondly, it's not so easy to separate money from recognition, especially in a society like ours. How many times when, when there are contract disputes of star athletes, the local journalists will say, you're already making millions. How can you be holding out for millions more? And what does the athlete say? The athlete invariably says it's not about the money, it's about respect. So what would be the alternative? I think that we should uh, debate public policy, including tax policy, not only from the standpoint of fairness, but also from the standpoint of social recognition and esteem. For example, we should have a public debate about why we tax earnings from labor at a higher rate than we tax earnings from dividends and capital gains. If we really believe in the dignity of work, wouldn't that lead us to call that uh, different tax treatment into question? Now, there are lots of debates about taxing capital gains less than earned income that have to do with efficiency um, or that have to do with job creation. And those are important. But I think we should also debate this question from the standpoint of what we value, what we want to encourage, what we want to recognize. And that provides a powerful argument uh, not to tax earnings from labor at a higher rate than earnings from dividends and capital gains. We could also debate whether to have a financial transactions tax and to use the proceeds to lower perhaps the payroll tax, which is a tax on labor. Now, one, one argument for that would be redistributive. But another argument for that proposal would be to question the excessive value that the market places on financial speculation by comparison with the value that the market places on the money people make by providing useful goods and services for other people. So what I'm trying to encourage is a broader public debate about what contributions to the economy we should value, not only by clapping for essential workers, but also by rewarding them in a way that better aligns with the importance of their contribution. That's a practical way of answering Luigi's question as to what, what, is, what, are, what are the alternatives, but what about the larger philosophical or moral grounding of those alternatives? In other words, if we're going to say that the market doesn't work, that meritocracy doesn't work, that, we, that a system in which people compete based on talents they were just lucky enough to be born with results in un, unfair outcomes, is the only alternative that we want to guarantee equal, equal outcomes? rather than just equality of, of, of opportunity. I'm, I'm searching for a broader philosophical underpinning right. for a system in the absence of a market-driven one, a market-driven right. meritocracy. Yeah, great question. I do think we need a principle that goes beyond equality of opportunity. Even if we could achieve true equality of opportunity, we would still fall short of having a just society or a good society. And the reason is this, equality of opportunity is a remedial principle. No one should be held, held back due to unfair uh, disadvantages or to prejudice. But we also need to figure out how to cultivate a common life. If we really believe in democracy, it's not enough simply to think of ourselves as consumers. We also have to make it possible to think of ourselves as citizens. And that means creating common spaces and public spaces that gather people together in the ordinary course of their lives. In recent decades, as the market-driven meritocracy has heightened inequality, the affluent have largely seceded from public places and common spaces. There are fewer and fewer class-mixing institutions. This is partly what has encased us in polarized, insulated communities. And so, Beyond equality of opportunity, I think we need to aim at a broad democratic equality of condition. This is not the same, Bethany, as equality of result where everyone must have the same income. 
a broad democratic equality of condition is a way of life in which people send their kids to the same schools from different class backgrounds, different racial and ethnic backgrounds. It's a way of life in which we encounter one another and bump up against one another in the course of our everyday lives in municipal centers, uh, parks, uh, public transportation, where the differences in income and wealth loom less large. And because this is how we come to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. We need to aim for a broad democratic equality of condition that enables every person to hold their head up high, to, uh, to enjoy social recognition and esteem for the contributions they make to the society, whether or not they are well credentialed, whether or not they have a university degree to be recognized and esteemed as citizens capable of sharing and deliberation about common purposes and ends. That's, that's what I mean by a democratic equality of condition. I would like to bring the topic to liberty. You mentioned liberty before. And when you start saying that we should tax some stuff and redistribute based on the sense of justice, Actually, and fortunately, reminds me a bit about, uh, and I know this is extreme, but uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, when when my father traveled to the Soviet Union back in the in the in the sixties, a pen was more expensive than a calculating ruler. Why? Because the power to be decided that a normal a ball pen was not necessary. You had the fountain pen, but the calculating ruler were very important for people to actually do calculation, and so. They subverted all the price system and they had some things very cheap. Books were super cheap, but any kind of quote unquote luxury good was super expensive. And so in a sense, there was a small group of people imposing their values on everybody else. How do you prevent this from happening if you go down your path? Well, the first way of preventing it happening is to recognize that the rules of the game shape market results. So, for example, uh, if we look at CEO pay, in the U.S., CEO pay is, is the ratio to that of the median worker is roughly 300 to 1, whereas a few decades ago, it was more like 30 or 40 to 1. Is it the market that delivered the, the news or the verdict that CEOs today are 8 or 10 times more talented than they were back in the 1970s? I don't think so. It's that the rules of the game were changed in ways that inflated CEO pay. For example, so-called pay for performance tied to a stock price, along with a system that allows managers to do stock buybacks. Uh, the only way to approach a system of fair reward, reward in line with what people contribute to the common good, is to discuss what the political arrangements should be. Uh, you're right, of course that any time we debate politically, what really counts is a valuable contribution to the common good, because where the labor market is concerned, that's what we're discussing. When we're discussing the rules that shape the labor market and the rewards associated with this or that job, we are making decisions, whether we recognize it or not, about what, what contributions should be valued and to what extent. So my reply, Luigi, is we, do, we make political judgments all the time when we design the rules of the game about stock buybacks, for example, about who should be rewarded um, to what extent. So my argument is simply that we make more explicit and more democratic the judgments that societies inevitably make about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good and how generously it should be rewarded. I could keep going forever, but I think we are out of time. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on our podcast. This was really helpful and thoughtful and interesting. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. So I think my favorite part of Sandel's work or thoughts is that he stresses the role of luck in life. And if you accept that luck plays a role, then I think you have to have humility. And humility is at least part of the solve for one of the worst problems of today's supposed meritocracy, because 
in my view, one of the worst problems is that those who make the most think that they do so because they deserve it. Luigi, what do you think? I am strongly in favor of humility. I think that that's a, a virtue that we should all have. Unfortunately, I don't think that, at least in the academic world, we do so well, and uh, the political world either. But uh, We don't do so um, well in the journalistic world either, believe me. <laughs> so, so I think that um, I'm the last one to say we shouldn't try to be more humble. But I dislike uh, trying to find uh, psychological answers or, or moral answers to economic questions. Not that there is not one, but I dislike to start with those. And I think there is a interesting economic reasons why now meritocracy has become so popular and why... Before people... we get to that, can we pause on that? Because that's such an interesting framing that you see it as moral answers to an economic question, whereas I see it as a moral question and a philosophical question. And maybe the answers are economic, but it's, it's, it's interesting that you, that you see it the, the flip of the way I do. No, uh, yeah, I, I think I am distorted by my profession. So I look at everything in economic terms. That doesn't mean that your answer is uh, wrong in any sense of the word. But before resorting to things, outside of my profession, I want to see inside if there is a justification and then move outside and see which one is better. As long as you admit that you're distorted by your profession, then we can move forward from there. <laughs> so I was wondering why meritocracy is such a big matter everywhere today. And I think that the answer is quite simple. Because income inequality has gone up, the challenge to that inequality has increased and the need to establish that this inequality is uh, justified on some moral ground has also increased. So the, the pressure to say, I make more money because I deserve to make more money is this de desire to say, don't touch me because I deserve it. It's all about the money. I'm actually going to grant you that. I think that the question of meritocracy is a philosophical and a moral one, but I think it is manifesting today because of the economics. And so I'm actually going to side with you and we can make this an economic discussion. Uh, but that, that is not to say that humility is not at least a good virtue to have to temper this. But I would like to distinguish meritocracy in two different areas, in broadly interpreted bureaucracy and in the marketplace. So let's start with the bureaucracy. And I would like to start with the example of an army. Who should lead an army? We all agree there should be the most talented person. Now, this is not necessarily a meritocracy, it's a talentocracy. So I didn't say we want the more meritorious to lead an army. We want the best. So you might be a SOB that cut corners, etc. But if you are the best leader, I want you to lead my army in war and not the goody tissue that has maybe 10 medals of honor, but has not the ability to run things well. And, and the army itself, this is what I found it interesting, the army itself divides between meritorious and promotion. And the two are correlated. If you have a lot of medals, you're more likely to be promoted, but it's not one-to-one. -one. I can have a lot of medals and still be a, a lieutenant, and uh, you can have no medals but be the three-star general, four-star general. While having a medal of honor helps you in the promotion, is not the only criterion, and we don't put at the top of the military the guy who is most decorated. Why? Because we make a distinction between being meritorious, you command my admiration because you did something remarkable versus you are the best leader in this moment at war. In the word merit, and maybe you correct me if I, my English is wrong, but this is a Latin word, so I have a comparative advantage. But in the word merit, there is an element of deserve, while in the word talent, there is not that at all. So I, can, I receive from God some talents, do I deserve those talents? Not obvious. Even the gospel is not obvious that the guy who received five talents deserves more than the guy who received one. So if I am the son of a four-star general and uh, I grew up in the military world, etc., and I end up being a little bit better than you at running an army, and you come from nowhere, etc., you are much more meritorious in any sense of the term. Still, if we are running a war, I want the most talented, not the most meritorious, to run 
from an efficiency point of view, is the talent that we appreciate is not the merit. Even Michael Sandal himself said, well, if you have a surgery, you want a more talented doctor, okay? There is no affirmative action, there is no deserve, there is none. So, you know, some, some doctors might be very meritorious because they came from poor family, they overcome discrimination, they do all the things that, but if you have surgery, you want the more talented, not the most meritorious. I'm going to go with your distinction because I'm not going to challenge your knowledge of Latin because I have no knowledge of Latin whatsoever. I think embedded in that concept of deserve is something interesting because you took it to a different place than I thought you were going to because I was thinking deserve is a bad thing. Whereas in your, in your example of deserve, the person who comes from the background where they didn't have all the advantages deserves to be given some marks for that. I think, though, I'm not sure that your distinction does that much for us, even if I agree with it, but I'm not sure your distinction does that much for us because that works in a bureaucracy precisely because the economic rewards are not that different. So if somebody gets to run this thing versus being a four-star general, the pay gap is not that dramatic. It is in other areas, and I think that's more the distinction than a bureaucracy and a market system, because where would you place the doctor? Is, he, is the doctor part of the bureaucracy or is the doctor part of the market? And we all agree we want the best doctor possible to operate on us. So where does the, the doctor is not really part of the bureaucracy. So where does where does that profession fall? We all no, want. No, I, I, I completely agree. But let, uh, hold on with me. I arrived to the doctor and it's my fault that I, br I brought it up, but Michael brought it up. So I think it was useful. Let, let's stick with the bureaucracy. OK, now the problem is in a bureaucracy is how do you measure talent? And clearly uh, in the army, if you are at war, you see the guy winning the battles. But uh, hopefully, we're not award that often, so you have to measure outside of that environment. And, and this is where the ecosystem of the creation of merit comes about. And this is where, in my view, the historical uh, narrative of Woodridge is fascinating, how the Chinese invented that merit was to memorize Confucius, uh, which was great for the second century AD, but a bit behind in the 19th century. Okay, so, so I think that the bureaucracy as a need to find an objective measure of uh, merit. And that is where some of the major problems arise because this objective measure, uh, first of all, does not really measure merit, measure talent. And in that, that sense is against the grain of the spirit of the people. And, and two, talent is multidimensional. And by, in order to rank people, you need to go unidimensional most of the time. And inevitably, this is a very fraught, a contentious measurement problem, which shouldn't lead us to say we don't measure at all and we randomly pick. Oh, so I think you're, you're making two really good points. And one is that we do want the most talented person to run certain things or be in charge of certain things. But I think the second point that you're making is a really interesting one, which is... Which is is there really any objective measurement of talent? And I, at least in the profession of journalism, I've always felt that that wasn't entirely the case in the sense that I could give a draft of an article to two different editors and get two completely different sets of feedback. And so I don't know when I think, and I'd be curious to hear your view of economics, who gets jobs, who who gets promoted. Are we comfortable that the most talented person rises to the top in, in, in most of our world? Or do we think that that's not the way it works? I think that clearly is correlated. The correlation is way below one. Uh, I can tell you that even in a field that is fairly math-oriented as economics, there is not a correlation one-to-one -one between being a good mathematician and succeeding in economics, which some people might find reassuring, some people might find disappointing. Uh, I, I leave others, others to make that judgment. But every attempt to say we should have an objective criteria tends to be very much compressing and creating one order. And, and I fear that we as educators tend to force that. There is a curve ranking in the grades. Uh, everything is, is ranked and everything is ranked unidimensional where I can say, you know, uh, for creativity, you are great, but uh, solving differential equation, you're terrible. And uh, keeping deadline, you're even worse. Uh, I think that, that th those are three dimensions. And in some jobs, you need to be more creative. In some jobs, you need to be better at uh, uh, solving differential equation. In others, you actually need to be on time. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's more important than being very creative. So having this idea that there is only one measure of talent, I think that's... Uh, 
a very dangerous uh, perspective. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I have on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should check out. It's called Entitled. International lawyers Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsburg have traveled the world, getting into the weeds of global human rights debates. On Entitled, they use their expertise to explore the stories and the thorny questions around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Subscribe to Entitled, part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's interesting because you don't see people complaining that much about the income inequality with athletes. I don't think that people are in the street complaining. In fact, they contributed to that by buying their products, by revering them, by doing everything that creates an ecosystem that allows them to become a super uh, millionaire, if not billionaire, no, not billionaire, but sort of a hundred millionaires. I suspect because they can see the talent in action and they recognize, and you know, whether they deserve it because they work hard or they are talented or a combination of the two, because I don't think you become Michael Jordan without being incredibly talented, at the very minimum tall, because <laughs> if, you are five, if you are four feet t- tall, you can be the most talented guy and there is no chance. But anyway, um, but also there's no doubt that the, those guys walk their butt off. And it's just, you, don't, you don't go there f- without effort. You know, that is, that is so interesting. And I think you are absolutely right to, to highlight it. We don't resent them, even though there's some element of luck in, in who they are. I mean, you could go, you could say there's just luck in being born six foot five versus, versus five feet tall. But to Sandel's point, there's also luck in just being, in, in being born with talents. But because we can all see it so clearly, it's just talent, sheer talent on display. We, we don't, we don't resent it. Would you call that, circling back to, to where we started this, would you call professional um, athletics a uh, talentocracy or meritocracy? I think it's definitely a talentocracy. Uh, but that's, again, because it's easy to measure the talent. When it's not easy to measure, it, there is a lot of preconception that go in, into, into place. Uh, so, should, yeah, that's, that's really interesting and, and a really interesting contrast. So I think we all agree, and I think we agreed with Sandel, and you tell me if you didn't, that the market-based system in, in many fields for rewarding people is broken and is out of whack. And, and In other words, I don't think anyone thinks that a hedge fund manager deserves to make a billion dollars, whereas a surgeon who's saving people's lives or a neonatologist who's serving babies deserves to make 300,000. I think we, we, we agree, at least I agree, there's, there's something out of whack about that. Where I thought Sandel broke, broke down, his argument broke down is what we do about it. No, I agree on what we do about it, but let me actually disagree a bit with, with the first part, which is, uh, there's no doubt that it's broken uh, in some dimension, but I would like to distinguish because Sandel in his book is very honest and recognizes that people like Hayek never said that the market pays the people that deserve the most. The market is designed to allocate resources. A a friend of mine bought a house outside of New York in the countryside before the pandemic and made a fortune because of the pandemic. Did he deserve to to make a fortune? Absolutely not. It was sheer luck. But, you know, demand went up, supply is constant, more or less, prices went up. And it's not because there is any sense of deservedness or merit. It's simply for a need of allocation of resources. So in that sense, I think we should separate and don't even think that the market rewards the most deserving ones. So this is not that the market is broken. The market is not even trying to do what you would like him to do. Now, the second point, which is different, is are we sure that the market, and this is what the market should be doing, and I'm not so sure it's doing, is the market is allocating the talents in the most uh, efficient way. So is it attracting the right people to go into fighting cancer and the right people into doing finance? But, and this is the real problem of the market, there is a difference between creation of value and appropriation of value. The market leads talents to go where the product of the value create multiply the value you appropriate is largest, not necessarily where the value create is largest. 
I really love that notion of value created versus value appropriated. And I think however the value is being appropriated, it is not how we as a society would like to see it being appropriated. In other words, I would rather see more economic incentives for people to become teachers, to work on saving the world, to, to be developing vaccines and to be hedge fund managers. And for whatever reason, the system has developed and it has and, and that gap has widened with, with the growing financial. Maybe it just all comes back to our problems with the financialization of our world. I remember a friend of mine who worked at Goldman Sachs back in the 80s and 90s saying, yeah, it used to be that you could make a million dollars as a Goldman Sachs partner. And that was a lot of money. But it wasn't, you know, in New York City, it wasn't 40 million dollars. It, it wasn't it wasn't the difference that it is today. And I think that's a problem. Yeah, because the problem is that once the difference is so large, it's difficult to have some other social value. So think about the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize gives you a little bit more than a million dollars, but it's not the money you receive, it's the prestige you receive. The Nobel Prize, by design, was created precisely to reward people who contribute to the welfare of humankind. And probably don't uh, profit so much from it. The problem is that once you make not 10 million, but a billion a year, you can buy prestige in a lot of different ways. That is an interesting economic model. What is the price of prestige? In other words, at what, at what income differential does prestige no longer matter? Because the, the financial outcomes are so disparate that you'd, you'd rather have the money than the prestige. But I, I agree. For some reason, in, in the world that used to be, I do think that prestige was worth more. And it's not worth as much today for precisely the reason that you articulated. And that's a huge societal problem. I think globalization might have played a part in that, in that global elite Elites are now competing with each other on economic terms rather than being parts of their community or even parts of their country. And perhaps prestige is tied to being part of a community or part, part, part of a country in that the good you did in your community or the good you did for your country was worth enough that it compensated for a lack of financial success. And now if you're competing with other billionaires across the globe, then the money matters more and more and more. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I uh, recently saw the speech that Truman gave when he stepped down. I think it should be taught in school because it's really moving. First of all, you know, he leaves the White House and he takes a train to go to Independence, Missouri, to live in the house that his wife inherited from her mother because he had no other possession. And uh, at the time, there was no pension for the vice president, was introduced later, and he refuses to sell out the presidency. So he actually lived uh, very uh, modestly in Independence, Missouri, spending his time with the mayor of Independence, Missouri and the community of Independence, Missouri. That is a completely different world than the one we live today, completely. Contrast that to Bill Clinton or contrast that, that to, the, to the money that, that presidents go on to make now after serving as uh, it's become a license to make money, in addition to being many other things, but it has become a license to make money. And you're right, that's a huge contrast. So I do want to end this by circling back to the discussion about Sandel that I didn't love his solutions, which boiled down to essentially talking about it, I thought. And I still, I still, I still, remember, yeah. I still remember an editor telling me when I submitted an op-ed, I think it was to the Washington Post, and it was on one of my little mini books. I think it was on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I said, we needed to start talking about what to do about, about Fannie and Freddie. And this editor was like, ah, no, if I see that, that phraseology, that construction one more time, we don't need to talk about it. What do you want to do about it? And I, I and to give, to give Sandel some credit, I'm being, I'm being hard on him, but, but yes, we do, we do need to talk about it. This should be a broader topic of conversation or, 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 or debate. But the problem is what, what do we do about it? And that brings me back to Adrian Wildridge's book, which is what's the alternative? And particularly, what's the alternative to a meritocracy in a world where China is embracing that to some extent and rising? What does that do to the U.S. if we turn our back on meritocracy, even, even, even with all its flaws? So I completely agree with you that uh, Sandal was much stronger in the critique than in the proposal phase. That's true of most philosophers, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but paraphrasing the title of Woodridge, I think that the secret is more in a responsibility of talents rather than a aristocracy of talents. Uh, I, I do believe that talent is important. We should rely on it. 
but it's almost like a responsibility rather than a merit. This is maybe too Christian because it, it resembles very much Matthew and the parable of talents. And if it does resemble, it's because it, it, it is. I don't think that uh, there is an alternative in trying to get the most talented people in the, uh, in the most prestigious position, actually in the most influential position rather than prestigious position, because they can add value to humankind. We should recognize if you do great things, is not only because of your talents, but is because of an entire infrastructure that is around you. So that's where uh, you should not be arrogant. And you should see that as more like a responsibility rather than a privilege. So I'm going to phrase this differently. I'm not sure it's a solution, but it is a way of picturing it that I find interesting, which is that right now we're caught in a vicious circle, which is that you pay people more and more, and therefore the things that rich people think they should be able to have cost more and more. It's this escalation, and we're caught in this vicious circle. And if, if you can reverse the vicious circle somehow, part of that is not just increasing the amount of prestige and the importance of prestige that people feel, but part of it is also reducing the gap between what great wealth can buy you and what moderate success can 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 buy you. Where I grew up in northern Minnesota, if my, my dad was a doctor and did, did quite well. We had a house on a lake. But the people who worked in the mine also had houses on lakes because houses on lakes just weren't that expensive. Everybody could have a house on a lake. And so that's a very different system than one where you have to be at the absolute pinnacle making a ton of money in order to afford the house on the lake. And if not, you're living in an apartment your whole life because you can't even afford to buy a home. As long as that's the world that we're in, then all the prestige in the world isn't going to make a damn bit of difference because people are going to see the practical outcomes of the system. Perfect. So Luigi and I thought we would add to our podcast by bringing in a little bit of the news of the day or maybe the news of the week or the news that's on everybody's mind, seeing it through the lens of whether this is something that is a positive comment on capitalism or a negative comment on capitalism. A capital is or a capital isn't. And we see this also as an opportunity for our listeners to uh, help us select for future episodes, because of course, all the themes we're going to talk in this uh, current review, weekend review, uh, are themes that we can go deeper in uh, a full episode. And uh, if you are interested, let us know. So why don't we start with the news that Purdue Pharma is close to declaring bankruptcy and decide whether that's a capital is or a capital isn't. Luigi, what do you think? So the news is not so much that Purdue Pharma is declaring bankruptcy. The news is that the Sackler family, who used to own uh, Purdue Pharma and was directly involved in the management of the company for a long time, is now declaring bankruptcy and get away with paying only four and something billion dollar in fines with admitting no wrongdoing. So I think that's what I think is pretty much uh, capital isn't. And uh, on this point, I want to re remember a, an economist, unfortunately passed away, Alan Meltzer, who used to say that capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without sin. It doesn't work. <laughs> that is actually a fantastic line. And I was thinking about that with another topic that we should get to, which is the discussion of student loan forgiveness, because it is extremely ironic that companies are allowed to declare bankruptcy. For-profit education companies that have defrauded students are allowed to declare bankruptcy, but students can't get out from under their student loans via bankruptcy. They're stuck with them for the rest of their life. So that's a small takeoff on that that we can come back to. But back to the Sacklers. I had actually written a piece about um, David Sackler had spoken to me for a, for, a, for a Vanity Fair piece that I did a couple of years ago. And what really stunned me about it and why I think it isn't a cap why it is a capitalism is the complicity of the entire system in allowing the opioid epidemic to happen. So it wasn't just the Sacklers lying to people and taking advantage of the system. The FDA looked the other way for a long time and allowed the Sacklers, allowed Purdue to market their drug um, with all sorts of claims that weren't, that weren't actually true. Other pharmaceutical companies piled into this. Big drug distributors and, and, and national drug stores looked the other way, even when amounts were going out their doors that clearly were way out of scale for the needs for the needs of the community. So when I when I look at this, it actually scares me more broadly about our system because it's not just that the Sacklers were able to walk away and keep most of their, their fortune. It's that so much of the system was complicit in this. And even today, no part of the system is really stepping up to, to fix the problem we've been left with, which is a gigantic opioid epidemic that is claiming tens of thousands of lives a year. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It reminds me of the movie Spotlight, where they say it takes a village to rape a child. And, and unfortunately, all those complicit elements that contributed to generally get away with literally murder because there is a villain, and in this case, the Sackler family, rightly so, so I'm, not, I'm the last one to try to defend them. But as you said, they are the front end of a village that murder hundreds of thousands of people. Many in that village who benefited, they don't pay anything, and actually they are now on the cheering side of saying, attack the Sackler, but uh, until yesterday, they were beneficiaries of their largesse. I will add more thoroughly the entire university system because uh, a lot of people in the university got money uh, from the Sackler family, and that money helped legitimize the use of opioid all, all along the way. It's, it's, a pretty ugly, it's a pretty ugly village. <laughs> and then you wonder why people don't trust the vaccines. Well, right. <laughs> you know, that's actually a really interesting parallel. When you look at what happened in the opioid epidemic and the way in which the FDA was complicit in this, and then we say, trust the FDA. They've approved the vaccines. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm vaccinated, to be, to, be, to be clear. I'm a huge fan and proponent of the vaccines. But, but I get why people have, have some skepticism. We have done a lot in, in, to undermine trust in institutions in which we need to have unqualified trust. So the, the big news of, of the week, at least in the sport world, is that uh, Lionel Messi, who used to play for Barcelona, agreed to a two-year contract for $104 million for Paris Saint-Germain. But the more interesting fact is not only that he's getting paid so much, is that actually he did not want to leave. He was ready to accept a 50% cut in his salary in order to still play with Barcelona. And... Uh, Barcelona could not afford even a reduced uh, salary for, for Messi. And so he had to leave. And, and he was crying when he announced, but I think he, was, he meant it. And I think it's a reminder that money is important, uh, but especially when you have a lot, it's not the only thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, although it does seem like it was, in the end, the most important thing to him, unless I'm misreading this, and I, I could very well be because I know nothing about sports what, whatsoever. But, but he could have taken a 75% pay cut if he really didn't, and he still would have made plenty of money. So in the end, there was a tipping point for him. And, I, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be. There would be for all of us, right? But in the end, there was a tipping point for him at, 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 at which the money was the most important thing. Yeah, there is a price for everything. But the fact that he was willing to sacrifice uh, tenth of millions of dollars to play for his favorite team means that that accounts for something. It does account for something. I, I, I guess I always get a little bit cynical, skeptical when somebody could have made $100 million and instead they're making $50 million. I mean, <laughs> if, that, if that amount of money, can't you still buy everything in the everything that it would even cross your mind to possibly want? <laughs> So how much are you really giving up? There's a little more sacrifice involved if we're talking about somebody who could have made $100,000 doing something and instead is taking 50. That feels real to me. The money we're talking about feels like monopoly money. In, in, the, in the language of economists, the marginal utility of money is decreasing. And so at that point, it's not that big of a deal. You're absolutely right. But I thought it was interesting in an episode about uh, meritocracy and yes. about uh, inequality, uh, in soccer and in all the other sports, but in soccer, there is a gigantic pain in equality uh, and is not so challenged by the fans uh, because they see with their own eyes the value of uh, the player. Where would you put uh, it, uh, Bethany? A capital is or capital isn't? I think it's a capital is. It's a market-based system where the market works as it, as it, as it is supposed to work. And he made a decision that was influenced by things other than money, but he ultimately decided to, 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 to go with the money. Nobody was forcing him to do anything. Um, it seems to me like a capital is. No, I think that uh, in the context of our episode, this is an example of, I don't think he deserves to make all that money. It's simply the marketplace allocating that, and I am fine, but I'm neutral. I'm not saying this is a... A fantastic example is not a terrible example, it's just uh, morally neutral, uh, it's just the market working. Capital 
Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcast.